our divorce will have a big price tag. Because it's worth it. Tenfold. This brutal story has it all. A cheating wife going for the next fix. Friends coaching on how to cheat, perverse victim blaming, and narcissistic tendencies. After she's kicked to the curb, OP thrives, which fuels her anger to concoct a narrative of victimhood. You can't make this stuff up. Stay till the end of this full story for bonus posts only shared here by Royal AI. Warning. The following story will be upsetting to cheaters. <laughs> Royal AI. Not that atypical, I'm sure. I'm hoping others can learn from my mistakes. We were married for 19 years, together for 23, when she became aloof and distant, with her finally declaring that our marriage seemed likely over and that she was on a healing path on AA. While I was broken, engaged in my career, doting on family, music making, focused on furniture building with friends and sports, she was spending increasing amounts of time out of the house to help celebrate a friend's sobriety. Teenage daughter and I were home together, without mom, many nights. Things got increasingly worse, with my wife stating she was willing to not file for divorce until our daughter went off to college with the occasional vocalized. What am I thinking? We've built a great life together. Interludes. Finally, after about five months of this, I couldn't take it anymore and read her emails, searched on the word love. Bang, jackpot. Confronted her. She asked what I found out, first mistake, told her. Got a new set of lies that conveniently served as least harmful explanation of my evidence. We only made out once. It was awful. We're just friends. I was crushed, having endured this before with my first wife. I told her she had to end contact with this guy, and we spent the weekend re-bonding, or so I thought. Things seemed to be on a healing path. But over the next couple weeks, she started backsliding into the acrimony she had inflicted upon me earlier. She began to urge me to work on my upper chest. I told her that I commuted by bicycling 20 miles a day and was in very good shape. I said I felt fine about my body. Her boyfriend had a big chest, I would learn later. More night celebrations re-enter our lives. I got a phone she had recently upgraded from and I did a deep forensics dive. I found very explicit text messages indicating full carnality. Turns out, her lover was an opiate junkie she met in AA. Five foot eight to my six foot two. Bankrupt, estranged from his family, pock-faced, poorly educated. I graduated from a top ten university and was, and currently, am a technology executive, making very good money. I was at least relieved that this reinforced my existing knowledge, that it was never about me. Reconfronted her. She wanted to know what new information I found. I told her, no, you'll just make up a new set of lies. Tell me everything or get boot kicked out of my house. Keep in mind, I already know more than you can imagine. It all came spilling out in ugly waves, all the basic sex moves one is driven to in self-destruction. I insisted she write it all out in detail. I confronted her junkie boyfriend at the third-rate hotel he worked in. Blew it all up. His hotel chain transferred him after I confronted him in the lobby. I told her I would consider the gift of reconciliation, but that she had an enormous amount of work to win back my shattered trust. She seemed grateful for the chance. Second mistake I made. Should have insisted she move out for some period of time. Unbeknownst to me, our teenage daughter had been reading Mom's emails and knew all the tawdry details. A couple weeks after the big D-Day, daughter got drunk, dropped some skittles, drove a car off the road, miraculously not injuring herself or others as the car flipped, teetering above a rain-swollen creek. Daughter got a huge DWI, was kicked out of National Honor Society and shamed at school. Mum decided I had to deal with all this because she couldn't. A couple weeks later, my ex had a complete parental breakdown. She screamed at our daughter, repeatedly yelling F you and 
You are the reason I want to get wasted drunk. You're the reason. I think about self-deletion. Then she peeled out of the driveway at a high rate of speed, to a fate my daughter and I couldn't ponder. Our daughter was extremely upset as one could imagine. I reassured her that her mother's outburst was completely unacceptable and was about her mother's cognitive and emotional state, and not a reflection on her daughter. Mom eventually returned, remorseful, but minimizing what she had done. Then, a transformation occurred. Where our daughter had been overly angry at her mother, now our daughter knew she couldn't be angry at her mother, as it could lead her mother to delete herself, which, in the twisted logic of Mom's tantrum, would be daughter's fault. So daughter took her otherwise understandable anger out at me. Mom, greatly relieved, fomented her daughter's re-vectored impulse to be angry at me. Mom encouraged her daughter to see me as the villain and the rightful recipient of rage. An alcoholic, Mom had to protect her alcoholic ego, and if it meant emotionally manipulating her own daughter, no problem. This got worse and worse. My wife began to see herself as the real victim in all this, which in perverse hindsight, she actually was. She declared with great relief that I've forgiven myself. She would stalk me on internet support groups for victims of infidelity, third mistake, telling her about my support systems, where she would find fodder for new screaming arguments. As should be fairly predictable by now, things completely fell apart. When a year into our attempted reconciliation, she erupted in a mocking diatribe about my deepest insecurities and sadness. The place every long-time spouse knows about the other, and knows to never exploit. She went there, hard, imitating me from moments years prior where I had shared my deepest vulnerabilities. She mockingly went into fake tears and exaggerated self-pity while maniacally cackling at my extreme discomfort. But that was my light bulb moment, and I now see it as a wonderful and enlightening event. If, in this time in which I was offering the gift of an opportunity to win my trust back, she was willing to obliterate all norms of marital decorum, to exploit the intimate vulnerabilities I had shared with her, my spouse of some twenty years, in order to vent her misdirected shame, then clearly and irrevocably, she could never ever be trusted again. At that moment, I knew I had to be rid of this cancer. I was now certain I could never trust her again, and I was not willing to be in a relationship with an irredeemably untrustworthy person. Where I had been racked with ambivalence before, now I had a calm certainty. The divorce settlement was ugly. I ended up paying her $200,000 to keep the house I had already paid for and keep my pension I had worked 20 years for, even though she worked and made a good salary, I had paid all the household bills, mortgage, car payments, taxes, insurance, food, etc. for the entire marriage. Not sure where all her money went over the years, likely to her junkie boyfriend? Who knows? The saving grace was the house appraiser she and her attorney insisted on ended up low-balling the value of the house by several hundred thousand bucks. That saved me from real financial ruin, and I got to keep my dream house, which is a custom-made high-end home perched on a ridge on three wooded acres, high above a beautiful, environmentally preserved river. It's not a huge home, but has a detached recording studio for my music, a woodworking shop, and is the calmest place I've ever been. Four years later, things are much better for my daughter and me. Our relationship is strong again, although her scars are still vicious and deep. She got into a very competitive college in New York City, where she's about to graduate. She tells me how much she appreciates that I never badmouth her mom, around her at least, while telling me how stressful it is when her mom curses me and speaks disparagingly about me, openly, and to anyone who'll listen. Now, my ex refers to her affair as her cry for help, and blames me for not seeing it as such. As she tells her remaining friends, I just slept with this guy a few times, and OP was too selfish to try to understand my pain. In her telling, it was the intimacy. She will never understand how minor that is, compared to the overall context of complete destruction of trust. 
When I hear these statements through the grapevine, my overwhelming reaction is one of relief. Now I have an amazing girlfriend who is emotionally competent. My daughter likes her too. What I wish I'd done differently, though. A full 180 demanded a post-nup as a symbol of her commitment to reconciliation. Invited her to move out as soon as I had proof of her cheating. But it wasn't all bad, because what I'm glad I did. Hung in there until I had 100% certainty. Never badmouthed mom around our daughter. Found support systems. Confronted her junkie lover. Knew this had nothing to do with me, but only my ex's brokenness. Royal AI. This post is intended to provide hope to those who are where I was five years ago. Some of you may have read my story that I posted last week. It has many typical elements of infidelity, trickle truth, victim blaming, gaslighting, etc. And it had elements of self-deletion attempts, daughter, and threats of going through with it, ex-wife to daughter. It was the most horrible time in my life, even more horrible than my first marriage's end in infidelity. Yes, I'm fixing my picker. Total Jerry Springer episode. But I wanted to affirm that healing and recovery can and does happen. I can't say I'm without scars. God knows they're deep and still raw, but I'm also loving life and where I am. It took a long time to convert my broken heart through anger to apathy regarding my ex. We had been together almost 25 years. We had a daughter together. We built our dream house together. I had supported her through various medical crises, job crises, and her attempts at recovery from alcoholism. She comforted me when I lost my father very suddenly, and we had built quite a life together. Her family loved me, and I loved them in return. Once it was clear after her affair that she was unwilling to do the hard work to win my trust back, I pulled the plug. It was very ugly for a few months. My attorney told me I shouldn't move out, so I moved into the loft of my marginally heated outbuilding. No plumbing, but private and peaceful. We negotiated the separation agreement over the next couple months, which would serve as the divorce settlement. Daughter was almost 18, so custody wasn't an issue. Ex wanted everything she could get from me, but fortunately, she and her attorney insisted on an appraiser for the house that seriously undervalued it. I paid $200,000 to remortgage the house and keep my pension. I moved back in in the summer of 2016. It had been six months since the split, and I started dating around that time. Too soon, in many respects, but my bruised ego really needed some validation after 24 months of lurid descriptions of what a horrible and undesirable person I was. The person I really started to resonate with was someone I knew, though not very well, as friends. She'd long been divorced from her philandering husband, who was not ironically a friend of my now ex. This woman and I hit it off and became exclusive within just a few dates. She is Ivy League smart, beautiful, also a musician, and deeply compassionate. But her most wonderful trait is her emotional competence. She and I have now been together almost four years, and we've not had a fight about anything. Disagreements, sure, but we work it out gracefully. She is in the process of moving in with me, in the house I kept. I'm upgrading many things about the house and de-skankifying it for my new love. We're both looking at retirement in a few short years. I trust her completely and look forward to growing old with her. She's not the kind of crazy girl that was my pattern for years. She's the quiet, kind, valedictorian type who is not seemingly competitive unless a scrabble board is nearby. She's very thoughtful, and my kids, siblings, and 94-year-old mom all think quite well of her. My ex is still fuming and fragile. She talks crap about me to anyone who'll listen, including our now adult daughter. I've evolved to the point where hearing that doesn't hurt at all, except on my daughter's behalf. Instead, I hear my ex's anger and perverse victim blaming, and feel enormous validation that I did the right thing. I have an overwhelming sense of relief. At the same time, I wish my ex healing and recovery. I've had some schadenfreude at her expense since we split, but that is diminishing, as I just want her to get her act together. I'd like to get along with her, 
not just for our daughter's sake, but because there's a good person deep inside the screwed up exterior. Pretty deep, but there nonetheless. At the same time, while getting along would be nice, I'm perfectly fine with her wanting zero contact with me about anything. That works too. Five years out, I feel like I'm in a very good place, with successful children and adorable grandchildren who live next door. I live in a beautiful house and have a deeply supportive partner who encourages me to be my best while loving my flaws as well. Still have some PTSD, but if I'd have been able to see into this future five years ago, it would have been inspiring. It does get better, I promise. Well done, sir, well done. As I say, I am in the divorce business, and stories like yours, those who rise above the tumult caused by a wayward partner, warm my heart. I love karma making visits to the wayward cheating spouses of my clients. I figure Mother Nature is doing half my job. And I do love the ones that take off for greener pastures, making their spouse and children's lives akin to a vacation in hell, only to be turfed. I have actually laughed in a cheating man's face. He thought he would be getting thousand and one adventurous nights. What he got was the former beauty queen, now seedy, overweight, with a laundry list of former bed partners and major flatulence issues. He left behind a good woman, not hard on the eyes, with a good head on her shoulders. Of course, while he was pursuing Miss OnlyFans, there was already a lineup to take his place. A great many men, no quality. When the expected occurred, he slunk back, only to discover that someone much better had taken his place. At last report, he is a sad cliché of a divorced guy. He threw away riches for the next shiny object. Just curious, how did your ex-wife react when she found out you were dating? She was very hurt and thought I was not taking her feelings into consideration. It really blows my mind how she could be jumping some junkie behind my back, and that's legitimate, a cry for help. But when she fails to win back my trust, after a year-long gift of a chance at reconciliation, I call it quits. Start dating six months after I've moved out and legally separated, and now I'm the bad guy. When I hear this calculus, I get less angry over time and more relieved to be disentangled from her alcoholic narcissism. It's been five-ish years until I called it quits from my cheetah wife of 20 years. Mostly healed, but scars remain, especially as they involve our daughter. But one of the enduring ironies, and there are many, is that her number one attribute in my eyes was loyalty. We had differences in certain areas, and our marriage wasn't perfect, but I knew she would never ever cheat. She cut off ties with friends who were cheating. She judged cheaters very harshly. She told me if I ever cheated, it was over and done. Finished. I took great comfort in this, and counterbalanced it to a lot of other negatives in our relationship. Her addictions, her narcissism, her callousness to my feelings. All those things were overlookable because I knew, didn't just believe, I knew she would never cheat on me. When I found out she did, a whole lot changed. Of course, the searing betrayal, the destruction of my family played out in front of my very eyes, and my sense of safety shattered. But one thing that really rattled me was having the foundational attribute of my attraction to her rendered a joke. The thing she would never do to me, cheat, she did not even once. She did it multiple times. She lied about it. She spent the six months of her affair vilifying me, explaining why she was some woke spirit at one with the universe, and I was some broken piece of crap. The lies and cruelty with which she betrayed me left me wondering, if I can no longer trust her, what exactly do I fall back on? Her beauty? She was pretty, but approaching her mid-fifties when gravity gets the best of all of us. Her intelligence? Well, that was a tool by which she devised her subterfuge and trickle truth. Her empathy? Gone. Yes, I gave her a chance to win back my trust. A whole year, in fact. And while she failed, spectacularly, I was almost relieved, since my love had been based 
perhaps too much, on her fierce loyalty. Yes, she went through the motions in that first few months, but over time, she rebelled against being cast the bad guy. She announced one day, I forgave myself, and looked to me to celebrate with her. She slowly changed her story, to one in which her affair was a cry for help, and became increasingly angry at me for focusing on my pain instead of hers. I was deemed the selfish and fragile one. These depictions were pushing me further away until she erupted one day in a mocking diatribe of my deepest vulnerabilities. The deep pain that only a spouse of two decades knows is there. She exploited her intimate knowledge of what saddened me deepest and made fun of me, laughing and taunting me. The light bulb, which had been glowing, went white hot. She was willing to destroy any chance at rebuilding my trust just to convince herself I was the bad guy. Of course, I knew all her vulnerabilities and how to devastate her, but I withheld. Later that day, I told her I was done with her. I wanted her out of the house, and I was seeking a divorce. I gave her every chance in the world, certainly more than she deserved, and she proved herself irredeemably untrustworthy. $200,000, and I am free of her toxins, much happier, but also prone to dark images of losing everything in my life. Home, loved ones, job. A haunting for which I am seeking therapy. Thanks for letting me vent. I wanted to provide a hopeful story to those who need hope. My two marriages ended in spousal infidelity, both with kids involved. It was horrible both times. First time after seven years together, the second after 25. I didn't think I could ever trust again. After lots of therapy, I realized my picker was broken. I was picking women who were beautiful, smart, but ultimately narcissistic, much like my father was. I did a lot of self-reflection and re-entered the dating scene. Prematurely, but I'm in my 60s, and I both wanted to have an experience with a female that was not horrible, as well as strike while I still had game. Though old, I reconnected with an old acquaintance. She turned out to be truly lovely. She's beautiful, Ivy League smart, a fellow musician, a former betrayed spouse, politically progressive like me, but has a huge heart. She's whatever the opposite of a narcissist is, a compassionate companion, truly non-defensive and loyal. We've been together four years and had no arguments. We've disagreed and no topics are off limits. She just has a way of calmly discussing tricky issues and we end up resolving things mutually. She moved in at the start of the virus that hit the world, and despite the general anxiety of quarantine, it has solidified our commitment. We're going to get married. We've told our children. Now we'll let our aging parents know, then siblings. Our kids are grown and independent. A therapist, an MD, a veterinarian, and a fashion executive. So they made it through the turmoil as well. I write this to let folks know with time and hope, recovery can not only be achieved, but life can be better than ever. Life gets better. Royal AI. Six years ago last night, I reconfronted her after she had admitted to some inappropriate making out with a guy based on me finding incriminating emails. The reconfrontation involved seeing her continuing text dialogue with the guy after the initial confrontation and remorse. I rooted her phone, found all sorts of disgusting, incriminating evidence of her affair with a junkie she met in AA. Six years ago last night, our daughter was at a friend's house for the evening. I told my now ex, We have to talk. She looked worried. What about? She asked. I just want to make sure I understand what went on between you and junkie. I'll use that name here, as it suits better than the actual name. I stated a bunch of statements she had said in her first micro-confession. Many of these statements I knew were lies, some I figured to be true. Yes, that's all true, she said with increasing nervousness. Then I said, I know for a fact that you're lying. Tell me the whole truth or get out of this house and don't come back. I was furious. She spat back. What is it that you think isn't true? I said, oh no, I'm not going to fall for that again. If I tell you what I know, 
you'll just make up a new set of lies to explain it all. Tell me everything or I will kick you out of this house. She collapsed and spilled everything. Multiple encounters, what actually went down, coital, many positions, all done in evenings when she was supposedly going out to celebrate an AA buddy's sobriety date. I collapsed in fury, sadness, heartbreak. The full mix of every negative emotion in the human range of feelings, each emotion maxed into the red and all at once. Within a couple days, I went to the hotel he worked for and said to him in the lobby, loudly, So, that's your game. Seducing mentally ill married women you meet in AA meetings. He was moved to another state. He began to make veiled threats to our family. We tried to reconcile. She was good at first, but over time she backslid into the kind of narcissism that drives weak people to alcohol. She spied on me in internet support forums so she could start fights. She threatened suicide to our daughter's face, blaming her for it. Daughter turned all her anger to me, the safe parent. Then, at the one-year anniversary of D-Day, five years ago yesterday, she went into a withering diatribe of my deepest vulnerabilities, insecurities about my children and family, mocking me and laughing to see what pain she caused me. That was the moment. That flipped the switch. I knew back then that time would heal. Not completely, but I knew that five or so years out, things would be much better. I was right. Things are largely healed between my daughter and me. I paid handsomely for her to be gone and got to keep the dream house and my pension. I am engaged to a beautiful woman who is emotionally competent. She has a daughter who is a therapist. I have a daughter who is a doctor, a veterinarian son, and the aforementioned youngest daughter, who is living in New York City, working in fashion management. I have three grandsons who live less than 20 miles away. My girlfriend and I will retire in a couple of years. The virus aside and twilight of my career work, hassles aside, life is great and low drama. She is extremely loyal and comfortable with herself. I don't fault myself for giving my ex a second chance. It helped erase any doubt as to whether or not we could work it out. Of course, she blames me for her cheating because that's what alcoholics do, whatever. All of this is to say it does get better, way better. I know a lot of you are going through a tough time, but I promise you, if you hang in there and reach out for help, things get better, way better. Good for you, my man. Obligatory question. Do you have any idea what the cheating ex is doing six years after? She lives in a nice but small house about a mile away. She got most of the friends in the informal friend custody arrangement, including friends who coached in how to cheat. She's alone with a small paranoid dog. She's still very angry and projects her self-loathing at me. She talks bad about me around our daughter, which causes them to fight. Then daughter comes to chill with me and my girlfriend. We only say minimal pleasantries about her mom when she, daughter, is around. I hope my ex recovers and finds happiness. But my investment in that outcome is really for our daughter's benefit. I think the fact that you're thriving is what's fueling her anger. People like that want you to be completely miserable and lost without them. Once they see that you're better off without them, they get really hot pissed. The best revenge really is living well, it's as simple as that. Perhaps, but I'm not moving on to relish in schadenfreude. Got an email from my ex, nearly five years after our divorce agreement was finalised. She wants a piece of art that was on the list for her to have, conditional on retrieving it within 60 days. She's four and a half years late. There's also a condition, that we split any medical expenses that we agree on, but were not covered by insurance. She continues to present me with bills out of the blue for expenses she thought were covered by insurance that weren't, or going out of network and expecting me to pay for it. I've done so to be a good sport. But now that she's insisting she is entitled to this piece of art, which is quite amazing and was in our state's art museum for a while, I'm asking her about her omission of the medical expenses concurrence and the 60-day window on retrieving her items. 
Predictably, she blew up and accused me of violating our daughter's, 22 now, HIPAA rights. I'm guessing she wants to get me to pay for mysterious things and not tell me what they're for. Daughter is increasingly telling me about her medical issues, some of which are understandably better suited for her mom to understand as they are related to gynecology. So, I'm keeping the painting. You enabled her by paying for things not in your divorce agreement. Stop that. You owe her only what is in your divorce agreement. Contact your lawyer, ASAP. Stop enabling her. I feel it's appropriate to pay half the medical expenses. I am merely asking what the bill is for. I don't give a crap about my cheating ex, but I don't want to make things more stressful for our daughter. That's admirable, but your daughter is now an adult and should deal with you directly, and your ex should simply not be a part of the conversation. I know that everybody's ex is crazy. I'm even writing a song with that title. So, ex of five years, and I had a kerfuffle over some items in the signed long-ago divorce agreement. She wants a 3.5 grace on picking up a piece of art, while I wanted to make it contingent on being kept in the loop regarding medical expenses and the depletion of the college fund as per the agreement. She turned nasty quickly, calling me names and talking mad crap. Whatever. I didn't take the bait. Then, just a few days later, my fiancé brings in the mail and sees something from my ex in the mail. I'm suspicious. Fiancé opens it. All it has is three photographs from 20 years ago at the ex's 40th birthday party. The three photographs show me and my now fiancé at the big celebration table. Fiancé was married to a friend of my ex's so X invited him and his then wife, now my fiancé. And I, of course, was married to my now ex. My now fiancé and I were acquaintances back then, but not really friends, nor were we putting out any vibe, beyond happily monogamous to our respective partners. Neither of us were remotely interested in each other, or anyone other than our then spouses. The photos are hardly implicating of anything. In one, we're sipping beverages, in another, I'm looking to one side of the room, and now, fiancé might be looking at me, or the same side of the room I'm looking at. The third we're largely obscured by a table decoration. There's no note on the pictures. We're pretty sure my ex has convinced herself that these are some sort of smoking gun images of a long-standing affair between us. We didn't even start dating until six months after the split, which was a year after the failed reconciliation, which itself was a year after my ex's affair started, and a full 16 years after these pictures. My ex is apparently projecting cheating onto me and my now fiancé. We've had a great laugh over this, although I fear my ex is selling this crazy narrative to our daughter. Regardless, I have a sense of pity that my ex is so deeply narcissistic and self-loathing that she is having to concoct a narrative of victimhood and blame me for the infidelity that she herself perpetrated. My response to all this is no response. Royal AI. For the newly betrayed, don't think that forgiveness is somehow the ultimate goal. Your betraying partner may push for this, and at some point you may forgive them, but that's not enough, and it's not the goal. I forgive my ex for cheating, she was in some sort of narcissistic haze associated with perimenopause. That seems to be her new forever state. I don't excuse it, but I understand she's a mess and it definitely screwed her up more than our daughter or me. I don't forgive how she treated our daughter, but that's another issue. The goal, whether folks can stick it out or call it quits, is to trust again. If folks stick it out with a very low success rate, It'll only work if the wayward spouse does the heavy lifting to win back trust. If folks call it quits, the typical outcome, even if reconciliation is attempted, the goal is to be able to trust someone else again, including yourself. Trust is the real casualty, and it is also the ultimate goal of healing. What are your thoughts on this?
Yes, trust is for sure a hard one, and was very difficult for me to regain with someone else. I never could with her. Another big one for me, is the loss of innocence. I had dated quite a bit before I met my ex-wife, and even fallen in love once. But I will never have that innocent love I had for my ex. The feeling that it's meant to be, some kind of fate, and just a total bonding and life building together. I have never felt again, and I never will. I love my current wife far more deeply, strongly and wiser than I ever did and I'm glad I'm not with my cheating ex. However, I really just wish I had never met her in the first place. I wish I had the capacity for that kind of innocence with my current wife instead. That's the one thing my ex took from me that I just can never get back. Forgiveness for me is overrated. I wrote this five years ago. My anger has mollified a good bit, but I don't disagree with anything I wrote. I never sent it to her, but it felt very cathartic to write. Bad to send. Would just give her more ammo against me at worst, and make her laugh or ignore it at best. Sorry it's long. You can skip this part, if you don't care to hear it. For the ones who want to hear it, here it goes. With the judge's signature on the divorce complaint, we are no longer married. We remain tethered through parenting and a shared history whose vicissitudes have been sadly overshadowed by the tawdry demise of our relationship. I retain fond memories of our relationship's early years and mourn what became of the kind spirit I once knew. I've been working through my thoughts and feelings on our marriage and its inglorious end. I'm not finished with that work and I imagine I will never be. I spent over half of my adult life with you, so detaching is difficult under the best of circumstances, ungainly and messy, given how it all ended. I'm thankful that the split has forced me to do some difficult self-examination. My work in therapy and beyond has enabled me to see who I am and where I came from with greater clarity. I am hopeful this work gives me new tools for productive engagements in my current relationship and beyond and your transformation over the past four years into someone I barely recognize has made it clear to me that I could not sustain a healthy relationship with the person you have become. Despite my work, I still retain a lot of anger at you. My commitment to your happiness was sustained and significant. I did a great deal to provide you a family, a home, while providing strong domestic support and giving you space for your alone time and social time away from the family. I honoured your feelings and did what I could to support you and make your life better. As a codependent, I often suppressed my own feelings and undoubtedly harboured unhealthy resentments for that. While you were kind and appreciative of me for many years, your demons wore you down and you became resentful, deceitful and ultimately subservient to your alcoholic ego. You cannot imagine, and I hope you never experience, the pain of having someone to whom you've dedicated yourself attempt to shore up their insecurities by tearing you down. When I needed you during my career crisis, you shrank. Claiming to not understand what comfort was, I told you repeatedly and explicitly what I needed from you. You pushed me away when I needed you and then began your focus on feeding your insecurities by destroying your own family. Was there causality? I cannot know. The family that you once wanted more than anything was pushed aside so that you could explore your self-doubts in unhealthy ways. You fell prey to the addictive fix of another man's romantic and intimate attention, and that became your priority over your husband, your daughter, and your family. You paid lip service to compassion and growth while you became callous in your behavior and your character shrunk into a self-delusional mess of hypocrisy our daughter and I gave you space to heal in AA. You turned that act of generosity into an opportunity to exploit and deceive us. The notable increase in AA meetings, in AA celebrations, in time away from the family, these were ruses so that you could pursue the tawdry affirmation of a fellow broken human. You constructed and publicized a story of my brokenness, which stood in contrast to your blossoming growth and self-discovery, predicated on owning your crap, pursuing a fearless moral inventory, 
and Buddhist concepts of the inevitability of change, all of which you used to cover and then justify the destruction you were wreaking on your own family. All of this hypocrisy was cruel lip service you used to uplift yourself, to mask your destruction, to blame me, while you cast aside accountability and compassion. You sought to cope with your self-loathing by lashing out at me and turning your back on your own family. And all for what? When confronted with your betrayal, you chose new lies to maintain the betrayal and further imperil any chance of redemption. It was only through my forensic technical work laying a trap for you, with an explicit threat of marital dissolution, that you told the truth. A truth even then contained lies as to the depths of your relationship with your lover, as you sought to further the pattern of making deals with the truth, to avoid full accountability. Despite all my pain, I gave you the gift of another chance. I was willing to work on the Herculean task of putting this behind us. If you were willing to be honest, remorseful, and do a complete 180 degree turn away from the narcissism and destruction that had captured you for over a year, after all you had done to me, my family and my dreams, I was willing to give you a second chance. And at first you displayed encouraging signs of remorse and of making amends. But over the year, those gestures gave way as your selfishness returned. You stalked me on support forums to collect information you could use against me in arguments. You vilified my anger as you continued to give yours free reign. You turned away from supporting my emotional pain and focused on making excuses for your behavior, on equivocating your role, on forgiving yourself and insisting you would not be put in the shame corner. You took umbrage at my selective sharing of my pain with others, castigating me for exposing your treachery to folks from whom I desperately needed support. That I needed support was irrelevant to you. You wanted subterfuge, a way to hide and deny what you had done. Your continued self-deception superseded my need for support. The breaking point for me was your tirade on the anniversary of D-Day, where you mocked my deepest vulnerabilities you did so with a malicious spirit that showed me in the starkest way possible who you had become. The reason I decided at that point to divorce you was not the infidelity or my inability to forgive you for what you had done to our family. It was that you had shown yourself to be repeatedly and irredeemably untrustworthy. I saw our reconciliation stood no chance against the compulsive demands of your narcissism. And I knew that without hope of regaining trust, our relationship could never be one of which I wanted to be a part. Although you want to believe my fragility regarding infidelity was the cause of our split, it wasn't the infidelity. That was just the most brazen manifestation of a much larger campaign of untrustworthiness. This spilled over into selfishness with the in-house separation when you brazenly moved back into the house under the noble-sounding ruse of supporting our daughter. Then you turned your back on our initial separation agreement terms, and aggressively pursued getting every asset you could, including inheritance from my mother, stock options awarded for years of service predating our marriage, all the assets you could legally, if not morally, claim. You continued your withering criticisms of how poorly I was handling the aftermath of your destructive behaviours, judging me negatively for not handling your destruction of my family while taking the opportunity to lay much of the blame for your swath of destruction on me, just so you could avoid culpability. Since the separation, you vilified me as being a narcissist, of caring only about myself, telling me how glad you are that we're done, accusing me of being an inadequate provider, not just for our daughter, but my other children, blaming me, yet again, for my brokenness. You've constructed a narrative of absolution, told it to friends, sold it to our daughter, and then denied having done so. Then between these moments of lashing out and re-vilifying me, you throw out olive branches? I understand you can't face the totality of what you'd done. I understand your feelings of self-loathing would become unbearable when faced with the reality of your selfishness, of having destroyed the family you once purported to hold as your life's priority. I finally understand how powerful the mental, emotional and spiritual brokenness is that underlies alcoholism 
I understand how thoroughly devastating taking full accountability for what you've done must be. I understand the power of the mixture of self-loathing and narcissism that drives your delusions. All of your betrayal of me I am putting behind me gradually and with great effort. The emotional devastation is slowly healing. The financial duress I am managing. The destruction of my dreams of a healthy family I am accepting. Moving forward and pursuing a relationship with the world that is honest and more fully informed is my goal. My regrets over how I handled the devastation remain, although as I consider how much of my life's aspirations of family, love and trust had been thoroughly and systematically destroyed. By your campaign of projected self-loathing, I cut myself slack. But of course, my pain and broken dreams aren't the greatest tragedy of your implosion. What I am really struggling to overcome is my anger at you for all you've done to your own daughter. My daughter. Through your behavior, you destroyed our daughter's sense of safety and security. You took her home and transformed it into a battlefield whose scars now overwhelm her memories of stability and reliability. She can't even stay in her childhood home now. You've thrown our collective financial fortunes into disarray. You were supposed to have been salting away the equivalent of the private school tuition into the college fund while I was dutifully paying the family bills. This would have put 110000 aside for our daughter. Where is the shortfall of the remaining 55000 Who knows? While I was paying mortgage, taxes, insurance, bills, groceries, etc. You were unable to fulfill your college savings goal. Where did the money go? Did you give it to your lover, who was clearly financially struggling? Did you spend it on other secret aspects of your life? Regardless of where it went, it's not there for our daughter. Now, we're having to live lives of extreme restraint. Despite paying 10,000 in lawyer bills, despite paying over 8,000 out of pocket for cancer-related expenses, despite having you wreck my car and not pay for it, despite incurring over 1K in veterinary bills for the dogs, you had to have 14 years ago because your friends had dogs and you were jealous. I still managed to save money for our daughter's college. Having given you a check for 60 grand in June, you've managed to save eight. Or, as you referred to it since, it's seven now. You can't save enough for her college costs, yet you curry her favor by sending her spending money and then vilify me for my prioritizing her education costs over her discretionary spending. What lesson are you teaching her? You inflict your financial denial and ignorance on our daughter by convincing her to not get an on-campus job. This leaves her extremely stressed out as she has been sold your naive delusion that somehow the family can fulfill your fantasy of a private college experience, replete with spending money even after you threw our collective financial fortunes into turmoil. My insistence on prioritizing foundational expenses and looking to her to find a way to earn her own spending money, has been met by you with name-calling, angry diatribes, all within earshot of our daughter, and all the while. Your saving toward her foundational costs is lagging in a worrisome fashion. Our daughter's near-fatal car accident was no accident. Having overheard your destructive behavior, her sense of security and stability were threatened significantly. This led to a troubling uptick in choices she made, which ultimately led to her near end. You and I agreed on constraints on her behavior as a response to her accident, and then you started bargaining those down, often in her presence, undercutting the unified front, to which you gave lip service as vitally important. You have since rewritten your own personal history to change the chronology of events, absolving your destructive behavior as a catalyst for her accident but the facts of my journal entries show that to be yet another self-delusion, to shield you from your own behavior. Her accident was a couple weeks after she learned of her mother's betrayal against the family and against her. Like many of your other self-delusions, you've sold this to our daughter so that you can maintain some semblance of absolution. But the most stunning example of your destructive behavior was your complete meltdown weeks after our daughter's accident where you screamed at her, yelling at her about wanting to delete yourself, and she would be the only reason for it. 
You've since confidently declared to me that you and her have put this behind you, but I am certain those words sunk deeply into her. In that moment, you declared yourself off-limits for her criticism. You told our daughter that you were considering deleting yourself, and it was a short leap of logic that any criticism of you might harm you. Our daughter had an understandably huge amount of anger that her security and stability were ripped out from under her. Yet, you robbed her of even the opportunity to express her anger at you. Many things came out of the joint therapy session we had that I cannot share, but this fear of you being criticised is real, and it's emotionally crippling. Enter your ex-husband and his anger issues. Our daughter knows I'm the safe parent, the stable one, and that you are unstable and worrying. She's told me that explicitly. So, I am the safe recipient of her anger, since she is confident I won't destroy everyone in response. Meanwhile, you take great relief in her anger at me, since it helps you avoid taking full accountability for destroying your daughter's family and protection. You embrace it readily, willfully oblivious of the huge emotional damage it is causing her. As painful as it is for me to bear the brunt of her anger, I take comfort that it is because she sees me as stable and reliable. I am trying my best to absorb it and see it as an endorsement of me as the safe parent. I have foolishly tried to bring this up with you and you quickly go on the attack, vilifying me for my displays of anger. You criticizing me for how I handle my emotions, yet you cannot see the blatant irony. Do I have amends to make to her? Of course, I have and will continue to apologize for getting in her face demanding she treat me with respect while you used my eruption to feed your narrative of absolution. And you've helped support her, generalizing my anger into threatening episodes, even episodes in which my behavior was truly non-threatening. She told me over the Thanksgiving holidays that she was furious at me. She told me, I will never forgive you, Dad, for the things you almost did. She's struggling mightily with the weight of all the pain you've caused. And when I point that out, you rush to defend her as though I were criticizing her and label me a narcissist. Yet you cannot see the blatant irony. You have repeatedly shown your willingness to put your alcoholic ego ahead of your own daughter's emotional health. And that I will never forgive. You're supposed to be her role model. What you've shown her in your devolution over the past four years is anything but an example of a healthy adult woman. You've shown her all about ethical frailty, moral turpitude, weakness, mendacity, facades of bravado, desperate obsession with physical beauty, and so much more. While I will get past your failings as a spouse, I don't think I can ever accept your ongoing repeated refusals to do the right thing as a parent. Our daughter knows deep down who you are, but she can't bring herself to face it because she believes she will be betraying you. She fears she will cause you to actually do what you yelled at her. She feels an extreme need to protect you, to take care of you in an unhealthy reversal of roles. In return, you're trying to curry her approval by giving her spending money, by indulging her embrace of victimhood and weakness, by projecting your own self-doubt onto her. She is a young woman with considerable abilities that your example is hideously undercutting. I have little confidence this epistle will do anything more than inflame your predilections to lash out at me and project your self-loathing on me rather than search for the truth in my diatribes. But I still care about you enough to know what good you're capable of. Deep inside the wounded alcoholic that seeks to further self-injure and blame everyone else, there resides an intelligent, caring person capable of goodness and rectitude. I just fear that inner person may never again surface, and that would be a shame, especially for our daughter. Twice, I had families destroyed by spousal infidelity. Kids involved, messes galore, hundreds of thousands of dollars lost in legal fees and estate settlements, Thousands invested in therapy for all damaged by it. Nevertheless, this Saturday, my beloved girlfriend of five years and I had an intimate wedding service before family, in the front yard and promised faithfulness, loyalty and patience for the rest of our lives. It was a beautiful service, 
my three grandsons were the flower boys. They were diligent, but the two-year-old wandered off to play with the toys he knew were in Grandpa's house, instead of scattering flower petals. The minister was a friend of my new wife, the photographer, a friend of mine for 40 years, and a childhood friend of my new wife helped organizing. It was a beautiful, low humidity, sunny but hot day in North Carolina. I love my father-in-law. My new mother-in-law is in the intermediate stages of Alzheimer's, but at least she knew her daughter was getting married to me, so that's good. My new stepdaughter is great, a 30-year-old therapist who is moving with her adorable mathematician boyfriend on a postdoc fellowship. My three kids get a stepmom, and the grandkids get a new grandmother. Bottom line, for those so inclined, you can find trust again. You can find love, and there are truly warm-hearted people out there. Context. She cheated. We tried to reconcile, but her efforts flagged, and my anger didn't subside. Since then, our daughter has largely cut me out of her life while knowing everything her mom did, which is a remaining source of sadness for me. I've since gotten married, which I know caused my daughter great stress. My ex sent me the following letter. Hi, OP. I hope you and your wife are well. I've learned about some continued, justifiable anger you have about my horrible words and actions toward you and our daughter, Jane. I want you to know how deeply sorry I am for all the pain I have caused to both of you. My actions were inexcusable, and if I could go back in time, I would make very different choices. You are a good man, and my infidelity was beyond messed up. I don't blame you for that in any way, shape, or form. The second I made the choice to betray you was the second our marriage was over. You can't come back from a breach of trust. The horrible things I said to Jane about her causing the thoughts I had and drinking make me sick to my stomach. She and I have had a lot of conversations and individual therapy around those horrific words and around my actions. I still try to apologize to her, but she doesn't want to talk about it beyond saying, yeah, that was really messed up. How I treated you and her is my biggest shame and regret. It was a betrayal on so many levels, and I take complete responsibility for my actions and words. The betrayed partner is never to blame for the infidelity. Jane has done a lot of therapeutic work to reconcile how her mother destroyed her sense of safety and the destructive and devastating impact that had on her life. That's not to say those scars will ever go away, I know that. She has emerged on the other side as a strong, funny, kind, responsible, compassionate young woman. She is healthier than she's ever been, working out every day, rarely drinking, and not smoking. She does not talk to me about you, and I do not bring you up except to recall warm memories of things, such as your wonderful snack bags. I know that you both want a good relationship with one another, and I have faith that you will get there in time. I do believe that and want that for both of you. I know that these words cannot erase the damage I've done. You have every right to be angry with me for the rest of your days. I'm so happy you and your wife found your way to each other and that you have found someone who can celebrate your many wonderful talents and qualities. Plus, she can sing on key. I'm sure you two are making beautiful music together. Wishing you all good things, OP, your ex. Seemed heartfelt, but way too late for her apology to really have any effect on current situations. 2,920 days, 47,720 waking hours, 16 a day. Five paragraphs. In those five paragraphs, there is absolutely nothing about trying to help you reconcile with your daughter. Although it's good she can see that she wasn't the hero in her story, and these wrecked marriages... I don't think anybody's the hero, comes with being human, I guess. The only good thing about it was it gave me an opportunity to tell her the only remaining sadness I have is regarding our daughter, and I did correct her about her being neutral about me. Daughter has told me quite the opposite. As for her, I wish her healing. I don't expect much to come from this. Why did your daughter have that attitude? Any clue to why? 
During our tumultuous failed reconciliation, my daughter had a near-fatal DWI just after learning all about her mom's affair. In the aftermath, my ex threatened the unthinkable in my daughter's face, blaming her for those thoughts. That understandably freaked out my daughter, then 16. That was a big turning point, where daughter turned against me, and my ex joined her in venting rage at me. In the aftermath of almost losing my daughter due to horrible decisions, driving while drunk, I wanted to impose serious constraints on daughter's freedom. Mom was too afraid of our daughter being angry at her, and thus indulged her to the point of betraying agreements she and I had decided upon as parents regarding our daughter's freedom, some of which she had insisted on. They repeatedly ganged up on me, and I started to wonder if I was going crazy. I hit my breaking point and decided the marriage was unsalvageable, so I angrily told my ex. I was done with her. I kept the house, where my daughter rarely comes. I think what happened was, this all showed my daughter, rightly, that her mom was extremely unstable. Daughter was afraid mom would actually do it, if daughter vented her anger at mom. So she got mad at the parent it was safe to be angry with, me. Happy to say daughter went off to college, did well, graduated, and is now having a vibrant career in New York. Far from the reminders of this absolute cluster storm. I was not expecting a story like this. It's ironic that your love for your daughter resulted in you sacrificing your relationship with her. She may never see it, which is indeed sad. But you can still be proud of what you did for her. I had an interesting visit from my ex yesterday. We've been split for seven years after a very ugly, year-long attempt to reconcile from her affair from a junkie she met in AA after some 20 years of marriage. She was horrible in the run-up to the affair, during the affair, during the attempted reconciliation, and the five years following our split, including poisoning the relationship between our daughter and me, despite daughter knowing all the details of mom's affair. She was absolutely a horrible, spiteful person during those years. A few months ago, X had reached out with a mostly conciliatory email after years of little contact. For the sake of our daughter and my own closure, I replied that I was at peace about it all, but I called her out on her false claim at never having bad mouth me to our daughter. X responded contritely that, yeah, she had done that, and she was sorry. She came over yesterday to fetch some old videotapes of our daughter and of general family history, presumably to convert them to digital format. My new and final wife made sure she was out of the house, although I told her it was fine if she was at home. X and I chatted for some 15 minutes. She was super nervous the whole time, apologetic and heavy with remorse. I was interested in how her family was doing, since I still care about them. She was embarrassed and apologized for having gone crazy and ruining everything we had. She was happy I found someone who was right for me and was truly sincere. I didn't respond much other than to peacefully nod and give off strong vibes that I had come out the other end, relieved and happier than I would have been if we'd tried to make it work. She looked sad and defeated. When I asked how she was doing, she perked up forcefully and said, I am doing great. But it seems she's still struggling. She was looking for affirmation that our 25 years together were not poisoned, and I nodded gently in concurrence that indeed we had some good times together. My body language was relaxed and at peace. She apologized for not being there for me when I was having a biopsy for cancer during her affair. Turned out it was all benign and began a litany of apologies until she caught herself and I said it was all okay now. She is still racked with remorse, but my calm reassured her that I was at peace. It was a good meeting. I realized in that moment that my anger about her cheating and our marriage is gone, except for lingering anger at how she's harmed our daughter and our relationship. I felt sorry for her and realized that, despite everything I went through, I was the least damaged in the long run, compared to her and our daughter, I will admit. There was a little bit of implied boasting on my part, 
that my life was truly settled and that I was at peace. But there was nothing forced in my vibe of happiness. No goodbye hugs or anything. When she left, I sat for a few minutes to bask in the realization that I've truly healed, even if some scars remain. I tried to forgive earlier for my own sanity, but I realized yesterday that I am ultimately better off for having suffered all that pain and that my implied forgiveness is genuine. I just wanted to share this story of triumph with those of you who are in the throes of the pain I was in seven years ago. That recovery is achievable, and when you finally get there, you might not notice right away. Ultimately, I think this is what a lot of us on here would like to receive one day, especially those of us who were treated like yourself, where our ex treated us horribly, when it wasn't deserved. When the relationship we had with a cheating ex was ultimately pretty wonderful, as was my case, despite obviously the cheating, this is an apology a lot of us won't get, especially when it's genuine, and that person does feel remorse for how they behaved and they recognize the loyal partner didn't deserve any of it. Nonetheless, it's still nice to read about. Thank you for sharing. For sure, it's an apology I never expected to hear, Frankly, after all these years, it's kind of sad to hear it. But the big thing for me is the realization of indifference and peace. Well handled and keep looking forward. I appreciate the mature perspective you've shared. It's great how sometimes things just work out well. I hope you are on better terms with your daughter. That brings us to the end of OP's story. He claims he protected his daughter, and it seems he did so, by sacrificing his relationship with her. Do you agree, or do you have different thoughts on this one? His story is rough, and even though he was momentarily more decisive when he filed for divorce, he seems to be somewhat stuck, stuck in a loop of constant reflecting, back on the betrayal, over-repeating the same events, tiring oneself down, and not really letting go. But. That might just be my perspective. Let us know what you think. Smack the like button, hit the bell, and I'll see you in the next one.